let's let's sing with them. Jesus. Amen. I want to tell you, God has done some special things this week. It has been such a blessing. We just came out of a fellowship with over 50 teenagers and uh, had, a, had a great time with them. And there is a, there is a spiritual hunger among them. And they are uh, desiring to hear from God and wanting to talk about spiritual things. And so that excites me. When you walk into the room and they, they basically want to ask you a question real fast, you know, or tell you how God's working in their life. And so we praise God for that. Uh, we thank God for uh, all of those that have been born again, uh, folks that have been saved. Uh, it has been a tremendous time. There have been many, many commitments made on the part of believers. These, these altars have had folks there every night, every service. We praise God for that. And we ask for God to do that again tonight. I, I want to tell you, we need His presence. We need the Word of God for us again tonight. We said earlier in the, in the time of revival that one of the things about revival that ought to excite us is that we be able to come together with the body of believers, with our family around the Word of God. That ought to excite us every time. Whether it's a Wednesday night, whether it's a Sunday morning or Sunday night, that we get to have that fellowship around the Word of God. And so uh, we're excited about that tonight. Brother Bill Britt will uh, be with us uh, again tonight. For those of you that do not know, maybe your first service here, uh, he is the founder and president of Compel International, which is, a, a, of course, an international ministry. And uh, we've heard uh, a lot this week about, uh, or some, maybe not as much as we would like, about all the different things that uh, the ministry is doing. And uh, we're excited as a church to be able to support that ministry every month, but we're also excited to be able to support it this week. And so what we're asking you to do, as a, the love offering that is being received is going to compel international ministries to support the work that's going on here in this country and that's going on around the world. And so you give as the Lord lays upon your heart when the time of offering comes, and, um, and then um, you continue to pray. You continue to pray for Brother Bill and uh, Miss Wendy and for his family and for the ministry uh, that God has for him. And so uh, thank you, Brother Bill. It's been such a tremendous blessing to us again. And uh, we look forward to tonight. Okay? So uh, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. We're going to ask him to bless this time, to anoint this time. And then after that, Emma Kate's going to come and sing for us. Okay? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, how awesome it is to be able to be in your presence, to be able to be in your house. This is your house. But Lord, this, this, um, this building, this facility is not the church. We're the church. The people, we're the church. So Lord, we're, we are so excited to be together together with the church tonight, with the family of God, 
with our brothers and sisters to be able to exalt, lift up the name of Jesus in this place. Truly, truly, we acknowledge you tonight as being a great and awesome God. And we desire to praise you with our lips. We desire to praise you with our heart. We desire to hear the word of God as it is proclaimed. And Lord, I pray, I pray that when the word of God is opened up tonight, that there in our heart, in our spirit, we'll be sitting on the edge of our seats wanting to hear from you and then wanting to respond in whatever way you call us to. So bless this time, we pray. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, amen. There's honey in the rock, water in the stone, manna on the ground, no matter where I go. I don't need to worry now that I know everything I need you've got. There's honey in the rock. Praying for a miracle, thirsty. Sweetness at the mercy seat, now I taste it, it's not hard to see, only you can satisfy, there's honey in the rock, there's honey in the rock, there's honey in the rock. Sweet is to trust. 
trust in you, Jesus. All over here, and there's no reason Y'all think you're hiding from me. You're supposed to be over here, but you're over here tonight. No reason for none of y'all, all of y'all to be up here singing. Just throw that in. Let's stand together if you will. The splendor of the King Close
praise the Lord. the Lord. Praise the Lord. Okay, guys, we're going to receive our offering at this time, so you can come forward if you would. And uh, we're just excited about, again, about what God has done in this place and already tonight and what he's going to do. There's two more plates right over there, guys. Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer and just ask him to uh, bless this offering. Bless Brother Bill as he comes in a few moments to share with us as well. Jackson, would you lead us in prayer?
Thank you, Penny. Thank you, choir. As they come down, let's sing this chorus. Let's just continue to worship the Lord this morning. Lord, we worship you. Offering myself up to you. Amen. And Father, I just pray that you'd do anything you'd like to do with it. Amen. Father, bless Brother Bill as he comes to preach. Speak to him. Speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord Jesus another hand clap of praise tonight. Amen. It's been a wonderful week, and uh, Brother Wilker and I have been talking. It's uh, Sunday morning. It just seems like we just got started. Here we are Wednesday night. Amen. Somebody asked me one time, said, uh, do those weeks get long? I said, it depends on the meat. <laughs> like this one, it's gone by real fast, and that's a compliment because God has been moving. Uh, I went to a church one week and stayed a year, amen? And, <laughs> but uh, it's always a joy to come to Sweetwater and be with your pastor and be with each one of you. This church has been a blessing to Wendy and myself for many, many years, and we're very grateful for all you do to help us take the gospel around the world. Well, we had a good time with the students this week, and uh, if you're sixth through the 12th grade, just stand up for me. Would you do that? I want to see where you are. And just keep standing, all right? Just keep standing. Let's, let's thank the Lord for these things. Now, I want to I wanna tell you something. I tell the students here every time I come when we have a youth night. Uh, I don't want you talking. I don't want you disrupting. I don't want you texting. Come on, amen. These guys could text in their pocket. And uh, I want you to listen, all right, amen? I want you to listen. Because if I see you talking or texting or not paying attention, uh, after the service, you and I are going to go out here and find a piece of grass, and we're going to sumo wrestle. <laughs> First thing you'll see is my belly button. The second thing you'll see is Jesus. Amen? So uh, I want you to pay attention. Well, you can be seated. Thank the Lord for you. You know, uh, all of us adults need to be thankful for children and teenagers. They bring life to our churches. Come on, amen. And uh, I tell I tell the, the adults, don't, don't get down on these students if they mess up and drop something on the carpet or, you know, do something like that, man, because we're excited they're here. Come on, amen. We're excited they're here. And then I tell the young people, don't get down on us old people, because if it weren't for us, you'd be sitting in the field somewhere because you ain't got no money to build nothing. Amen. <laughs> So we all need each other. Come on, amen, we do. And so thank God for that. I was uh, telling Brother Wilk and some folks this week, I was doing a youth uh, uh, meeting, and the kids had come in to eat pizza, and they were going back to the, uh, to the auditorium. And the youth pastor said something kind of tongue-in-cheek, but he spoke a lot of truth. He said, you know, Bill, these young people are doing the best they can to raise their parents. <laughs> a lot of truth in that statement, right? But I thank God for so many of you that love Jesus 
and that are sure your mom, your, your children are hearing the word, not at church only, but at home. Amen. And, and man, I'm telling you, our teenagers desperately need stability in our homes. And they need a mama and a daddy that loves Jesus with all their heart. Come on, amen. And, and that will correct them and, and love them enough to correct them and uh, to, to admonish them and encourage them. And so thank God for that. Well, take your Bible tonight, turn to the Gospel of John, and find chapter 1. I really wasn't going to preach this tonight, but I just, through all the week, it just seems like this is the word that we need on this last night of this uh, series of meetings. And uh, look at John chapter 1 and verse 35. We're going to read kind of a lengthy passage tonight, but I'm going to ask you to stand with me anyway. And uh, I'm going to make some running commentary as we read through this scripture. If you're there, say, I'm there. Amen. Again, the next day, John, this is John the Baptist. You remember John the Baptist, don't you? The forerunner of Jesus. Uh, he said, I'm not the one. I'm just here to point you to the one. I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. I'm just a voice crying in the wilderness. The forerunner of the Lord Jesus. The next day, John stood with two of his disciples. Now get this, John the Baptist, two of his disciples. And looking at Jesus as he, Jesus, walked, he, John the Baptist, said, Behold the Lamb of God. Aren't you glad for the Lamb of God tonight? Amen. That takes away the sin of the world. Amen. A man who knew no sin became sin, that we may be right with God. The Bible says the two disciples heard him, heard John the Baptist speak. They followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and seeing them following, said to them, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which is to say when translated teacher, Where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day, and that was about the tenth hour, four, four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two that heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. I want to encourage you to do a study of Andrew sometime. Andrew was a great soul winner. He was always telling somebody about Jesus. And notice what the Bible says. When Andrew uh, came to know the Lord, he found his own brother Simon. He found him. The word found there, we're going to talk about that tonight. It's an interesting word. And he said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. When Jesus looked at him, he said, you are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. The following day, Jesus wanted to go to, Phil, uh, to Galilee, and he found Philip. He said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathaniel. A lot of people find him, folk, in the scripture. <laughs> Philip found Nathaniel and said to him, We have found him, whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathaniel said to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. You may be seated. I want to speak to you tonight on a simple subject, but a very deep subject, following Jesus. What does it look like to follow Jesus? Well, if we have a little time tonight, extra time, we would go back a little earlier in the scripture and discover that Jesus has been baptized. Now, why in the world would Jesus, the Son of God, God in the flesh, have need of water baptism? Matter of fact, when he went to John the Baptist, John said, I don't need to baptize you. You need to baptize me. And Jesus said, no, you're going to baptize me that the scriptures may be fulfilled. And so John baptizes Jesus. And when he comes up out of the water, it was as if a dove came from heaven, lit upon him, a picture, a sign of the Holy Spirit. And the Father spoke and said, this is my son. And so Jesus was baptized. And we have, by the way, we have a good picture of the Trinity right there. Amen. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus began his ministry by being baptized. Now, why in the world was Jesus baptized? Well, let me just give you a couple of thoughts uh, for time's sake tonight. Number one, I believe Jesus was baptized to identify with us. Aren't you glad that we don't have a God that's a million miles away tonight? Some senile grandpa God in a rocking chair somewhere. Aren't you glad we don't have a God made out of rock or stone or wood or metal? But we have a living God. Amen. And Jesus came to identify with us. Even though he never sinned, he came and walked among us. Can I tell you tonight, this ought to encourage you. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what storms you're, had, uh, you're into right now. I don't know what emotions may be overwhelming you right now. But I do know this, Jesus understands that. Amen. He's been tempted in every way that we are, yet without sin. 
He knows what it's like to be lonely. He knows what it's like for his best friends to walk out on him. He understands. He knows. He feels. Are y'all listening to me tonight? That's why we can cast our cares upon him. He identified with us. But second of all, he inaugurated his public ministry through baptism. Now watch this. Listen to me. And since that day, since that day, every sincere follower of Jesus Christ has followed the Lord's example by being baptized in water. Amen. Amen. Now, he wasn't sprinkled. He didn't have a few drops of water dropped on his head. He was put under the water. Come on, amen. amen. That's a whole other sermon for a whole other day, and everybody said amen. amen. But Jesus was baptized. He went under the water. He came up out of the water, and he set an example for us. Now, every sincere follower of Jesus has followed him and his example of being baptized. Now, I'm just going to tell you from my own uh, conviction and I, I have a real struggle with somebody that says they got saved, but they refuse to get baptized in water. Now, I've been a Baptist all my life, and I, I, and I want you to understand, I've heard a lot of sermons on baptism, but most of them have been negative. You know, the, the, the baptistry doesn't save you, the water doesn't wash your sins away. Hey, we all know that tonight, but that does not demean the, the need of being baptized. That does not lessen the meaning of baptism. Listen to me. Baptism is your profession of faith, not walking down an aisle. Your baptism is your profession of faith. And listen, when, when the pastor puts you under the water, you're saying, I believe Jesus died for my sin. And when, he, you, when you come up, you say, I believe he rose again and he's alive. And then it says, the old person that I was is dead and I'm a brand new creation in Jesus Christ. Uh, there's a guy in our church, he's our men's uh, director of our men's ministry now, Matt Kenny. And uh, when Matt was in high school, they, they nicknamed him Julio and he wasn't even a Spanish. <laughs> Amen, but... Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, Matt was that guy, you know, the party happened when he showed up. Amen. He was the party guy. And, man, he got radically saved. His wife got saved. And so some people, even now, they hadn't seen him in a long time, say, hey, Julio. He said, man, he said, I'm not Julio anymore. I dug a hole and buried him. Amen. I'm a brand new person. And I want you to know, when you get baptized, you're saying, I, I, the old person I was is dead, and now I'm alive in Christ Jesus. Now, some of you here tonight haven't been scripturally baptized. Got quiet on that. You see, some of you tonight say, well, I came from another tradition and I was baptized as a baby. No, you weren't. A baby can't repent. A baby can't be born again. Come on, amen. You say, well, when I was 7, 18 years old, I made a profession of faith, and I got baptized, and then I got saved when I was 18, 20, so I've already been baptized. No, you just got wet. <laughs> Baptism always follows your salvation. I wear a wedding ring on my left hand, on my, on, on, on my, on my finger here. Now, this wedding, listen, I can, put, I can take this wedding band off, put it on the pulpit. I'm still married. This ring doesn't make me married, but it says to everybody that I am married. Come on, amen. When people see this ring on my finger, they say, that guy belongs to somebody. Can I hear an amen tonight? Amen. And so baptism says, I belong to Jesus. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I want to identify with him. Come on, amen. Are y'all here with me tonight? Yeah. So at the end of this service, I'm telling you, there's a lot of you probably tonight need to come down this aisle to your pastor and say, Brother Wilton, I want to get my baptism on the right side of my salvation. I want to be a sincere follower of Jesus Christ. A, a, a preacher you know, good friend of mine. My wife and I flew into the town where he was a pastor. We went to eat with he and his wife. He said, Bill, he said, man, we've been wrestling with something. We realized we didn't get saved as kids. We got saved as young adults. Therefore, we've never been baptized scripturally. And I'm the pastor of the church. He said, would you baptize me at the end of the service tomorrow night? I said, I sure would. So here the pastor and the evangelist show up in the baptistry. And all the deacons started Casting bets on who, who got saved, the pastor or the evangelist. And I baptized the pastor. I got out of the water. He baptized his wife, and no less than 10 people came down the aisle and said, Don't let the water out. We want to get on our, our baptism, right? My pastor, Brother Gavin Spinney, he, he got baptized after he had been the pastor of our church. You see, it's, it's are y'all listening to me tonight? Now, so what does it mean to follow Jesus? Well, you get born again. You repent toward God. By faith, we come to Christ. We talked about that last night. 
And then you follow him in water baptism. Come on, amen or not? And then you sit on a pew and wait on Jesus to come back. That's the way most of us are. We sit on our blessed assurance, waiting on the rapture bus to come pick us up. Come on, amen. No, there's a lot more to being saved than receiving Christ and getting back. That's just the beginning. So in this scripture tonight, I I believe we see a beautiful picture of what it means to follow Christ. First of all, I I want you to see uh, tonight in our scripture that we just read tonight, I want you to understand there is a there is a preeminent one who invades our life, and his name is Jesus Christ. We sang a song tonight, How Great Is Our God. The first time I heard that song was when Wendy and I were smuggling Bibles into Turkey. And we got in a room with 100 believers. There's only about 3,000 believers among 80 million people in Turkey. We got in a room with 100 people, and the first time I ever heard that song was in that room. And those people were risking their lives by being in that room. And I saw them with their hands up singing, How Great Is Our God, not really knowing if they would live or die. And when Jesus invades your life, he doesn't just become a priority. He becomes the preeminent one. That means number one. He won't play second fiddle. Come on, amen. So remember the scripture? Here's John the Baptist. He points to Jesus. He says, hey, boys, that's that's, that's the Messiah. That's the Lamb of God I've been telling you about. And watch this. These two disciples stopped following John the Baptist, and they started following Jesus. What a picture. When you get born again, you stop living like you've been living. You stop thinking like you've been thinking. You stop going where you've been going. You stop, you, you, you stop living like, listen, I'm telling you, everything, is anybody listening to me tonight? Everything changed. My wife asked me one night, Bill, would you watch a beauty pageant with me? Do I look like I want to waste my life? I'd rather give birth to a flaming porcupine, Amen. <laughs> But I did, and, and, and in all fairness, Wendy has watched a lot of football with me through the years, and baseball, and basketball. So I sat there and I watched this beauty pageant. And I'm glad I did, because they interviewed a former Miss America, and right there in the middle of the interview, she just kind of blurted out, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I thought, man, that's powerful. But then she said, Jesus is not the most important thing in my life. And that's what I said. Until she said, he's not the most important thing in my life. He is my life. Big difference. I'm going to put something on you tonight. Jesus does not care at all about being important to you. He demands to be preeminent to you. That means before sports, before girlfriends, boyfriends, Wives, husbands, children, careers, money. Hello, somebody. He's number one. But everything, listen, how many times have I talked to people? Well, you know, we can't have revival meetings anymore because nobody show up. You know, we got travel ball. We got uh, we got football. We got this. We got, you know, everybody's canning. They're planting gardens. They just won't come. I want to tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. It's a sad commentary when we got to beg people and give away Six Flags tickets and all that junk just to get God's people to come to church. He's number one. You got time to watch the news. You got time to read the Bible. You got time to scroll Facebook, you got time to pray. Come on, somebody help me here tonight. He's number one. Our time, our talents, our treasures, he is is Lord tonight. Here's the deal. When you got saved, listen to me, you signed the bottom of a blank sheet of paper and said, Jesus, you fill in the rest. And if he calls you to be a missionary to Iraq tonight, you say, yes, sir. If God calls you to move across the country, you move. Come on, amen. Is anybody listening to me? Here it is. Lord, the answer is yes. Now, what's the question? I wanted to be a football coach. God said, who asked you? 
Can I tell you something tonight? I've been saved since Methuselah. <laughs> and God's never asked my opinion about one thing. <laughs> Has everybody got first, the first point? You get saved, you get baptized, he becomes a preeminent one. Matter of fact, that's what Paul wrote to the book in the book of Colossians. He said that he might have preeminence. But then the second thing is this. When he becomes the preeminent one in your life, now he makes the plan. Now, notice what it says here. Jesus turned to these guys and said, what do you want? What do you follow me for? And they said, well, where are you going to be hanging out? And Jesus said, come and see. And they went. It was about four in the afternoon. They just hung out with him. Come on, amen. Now, here's the interesting thing about it. They didn't ask him where they were going, how long they were going to be there, how much it was going to cost, how comfortable it was going to be. They just wanted to be where Jesus was. Amen. What would happen in our churches if we just wanted to be where Jesus is, in his presence? Jim Elliott took four of his buddies to Ecuador to win the Aki Indians to Christ. Before one person was saved, all five of those men were dead, speared to death. People said, what a waste. Young men are dead. They've left young wives and little children. It was, there was no sense in them going to that beach that day. But you know, Jim Elliott had written in his journal, a man is no fool to give up that which he cannot keep, to keep that which he cannot lose. And here's a spiritual principle tonight I wish I'd have learned as a teenager. The only thing that you and I will ever possess is what we give away. You can chew on that tonight while you're going to sleep. Amen. Let's fast forward 50, 60 years. All that tribe of Indians have been saved. And now they've been missionaries to South America for 50 years. Was it worth it? In the year 2000, Wendy and I were invited to Amsterdam by the Billy Graham organization. And uh, there were 10,000 evangelists from all over the world. And one night in one of our uh, plenary sessions on that platform was Stephen Saint, who was Nick Saint, who was... Jim Elliott's good friend that was speared, his son Stephen is standing on the platform with his children. The man to his right was one of those Indians that speared his daddy. Born again, preaching the gospel. Do you know what those children call that man? Grandfather. Do you know who baptized Jim Elliott's kids? The man that speared Jim Elliott. And we can't get Baptists to come to church in the rain. It takes about 90 gallons of water to baptize a Baptist and 19 drops of rain to keep them home. <laughs> we can deer hunt in the rain. We can shop in the rain. Can't come to church in the rain. Y'all go to a ball game and pay $17 for a Coke and a hamburger and gripe about an offering at the church. I've been to a few Dallas Cowboy games, and uh, I want to tell you a blessing, Brother Chris. <laughs> a friend of mine had two season tickets to the Cowboys game sitting on the dash of his pickup. Somebody broke in and left two more. <laughs> Hey, listen, people walk for miles to that stadium. Just like the Saints. I thought about becoming a Saints fan. Somebody said, why? I said, well, I had this great expectation every year for the Cowboys to go to the Super Bowl, and they always let me down. If I become a Saints fan, I'll have no expectation. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> They'll pay seven, eight, ten bucks for a beer or a soft drink. 10 or 12 bucks for a hamburger. I mean, sit in those little old seats. And you know what I noticed, Brother Wilson? Everybody's happy. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> you come to church, look like we've been baptized in persimmon juice, man. <laughs> Got a face along, take you $5 to get a shave, eat corn out of a five gallon bucket, never bend over. Y'all listen to me tonight. These guys just wanted to be where Jesus was. 
no matter what it costs. What's God calling you to do tonight? It might just be as simple as walking across the road and telling your neighbor about Jesus. It might be going on a mission trip with your church. It might be taking your Bible to school and being a bold witness for Christ. I heard a story just this week about a young man. He graduated from high school with honors, but he was so burdened about the, the, the students at his school that were not saved, he went to the principal and said, can I repeat the 12th grade? For the sole reason of, of sharing the gospel. And he led 75% of his classmates to Christ that year. You see, the Lord calls the shots. Is anybody listening to what I'm saying tonight? And then, in the last part of our scripture tonight, somebody led somebody that led somebody, somebody found somebody that found somebody that found somebody. Now, the word found there it doesn't mean you, you bumped into them at the store. The word found there, study it for yourself, it means you seek after somebody. You go after them. Come on, amen. You go after them. You don't sit in your living room and kill a buck. You don't sit in your living room and catch a bass. You go after them. Amen or not? Amen. We go after them. And I want to tell you something. Here's what God has left us here to do. He, we get saved. We get baptized. He becomes preeminent. He calls the plans in our life. Now watch this. And then he leaves us here for a purpose. And it's to glorify Jesus Christ. It's to magnify him. It's to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. The book of Acts, it said they could not help but speak of the things they've seen and heard. I want to tell you something. You get full of Jesus, you're, or you, you, you get full of the Holy Spirit, you're going to talk to people about Jesus. They found somebody, and that person found somebody, and that person found somebody. And that's how the gospel got from Jerusalem to Quitman, Louisiana. Aren't you glad somebody told you? Might have been your mom, your dad, an evangelist, a pastor, might have been a missionary, might have been a next-door neighbor, a work associate, a schoolmate. Aren't you glad somebody told you about Jesus? I got through preaching in Kenya one time just in a street crusade. Just a, uh, we just go to a marketplace and preach, and, and we had a, a lot of folks get saved, and there was two men kind of hanging around. And, you know, when it was all over, they came up to me, and through my interpreter, you know what they said? They said, we don't know who sent you here, but when you get back to America, tell them thank you. Amen. The world's waiting on you tonight. I was preaching in a Bible conference. And the youth pastor at that church had been saved out of drugs and alcohol, rough life. His wife had been saved out of the same background. His dad came over to that Bible conference from Mississippi to be with his son and daughter-in-law. When he got there, his son said to his dad, I'm going to go find my sister, bring her to this meeting. And the dad said, how do you know where she is? He said, well, I know she's in this city. And the Lord's going to show me. So he drove to a certain part of town, and she was sitting on the curb. He put her and her boyfriend in the truck, brought them to the meeting, and they both got saved. He found them. I said he found them. Man, the daddy, he, he was all fired up. Next morning, he went down to the gas station to fill up his truck. It was real early in the morning. There was a utility truck with a bunch of, uh, with a work crew in it. They pull up on the other side of the, of the island. And so uh, Denver was the guy's name his, who, who was there with his son. And Denver was singing some song, and he can't hold a tune in the bucket, but he was singing it. The guy that was putting diesel in that utility truck said, hey, this is kind of a weird thing. But he said, you, you look like you've got joy. Boy, we need some of that. Amen. amen? Joy doesn't have nothing to do with happiness. Come on, amen. He said, I do have joy. He said, why? He said, because of Jesus Christ. Can I tell you about it? And the guy said, just a minute, I'll be right back. He went and got his whole crew. They stood around that gas pump, and Denver led everyone on to Christ. Well, Denver was raising some of his grandkids because all his kids had been in drugs and been living a, a lifestyle like that. So he was raising some of his grandkids, and he, he was going to adopt them. And so he had to go to court. And so state's attorney got up and said, 
Judge, I don't think we need to grant this man these kids. He's got a checkered past. And so Denver's attorney said, I think we ought to at least hear his side of the story. The judge said, I agree. So Denver got on the, on the, in, in the uh, up there in the, uh, whatever you call that. What do you call that? In the witness uh, chair. And so uh, he said, you know what? I've got more than a checkered past. I've got a wicked past. But that's all under the blood of Jesus. I've been delivered from drugs and alcohol. I don't go to the bars. I don't, I don't fight. I don't do all that anymore because Jesus Christ changed me. And I'm raising these kids in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I'm reading them the Bible. I'm praying with them. I'm taking them to church. And God has changed my family. Totally changed my family. And the judge looked at the state's attorney and said, what you going to do with that? I award these kids to this man. You see, ladies and gentlemen, that's why Jesus left us here. Why did he take you to heaven the moment you got saved? He left you here to find somebody, man. And we don't even witness to our own family members. I'm going to give you something you can use when you walk out of here tonight. You say, I don't know what to say. I get nervous. L let me say a couple of things. First of all, if you're saved tonight, you know enough about the gospel to tell other people how to be saved. If you're really saved tonight, you know, come on, somebody say amen. amen. But here's something you can use tonight. Tomorrow, when you go to work, to school, and you go to the store, just walk up to somebody and say, hey, excuse me, you know why I'm not in heaven? And they're going to say, why? Because Jesus left me here to tell you how to get there. Come on, amen. That's easy. Come on, amen. He left us here for a purpose. Listen, I can't convict anybody. I can't save anybody. But God did tell me to tell him. Come on, amen. amen. So are you a follower of Jesus tonight? Have you been born again by the grace of God? Have you been saved by the grace of God? Has your life been changed? If you hadn't been changed, you don't know Jesus. No change, no Jesus, no Jesus, no change. He changes you. Come on, amen. amen. Listen, he becomes the preeminent one to you. He becomes Lord. He's boss. He's ruler. And now we're walking in his will. He may not call you to be a pastor or a preacher. He may call you to be a businessman, a school teacher. I don't know what he's going to have you do. Or I don't know what he's got you to do. But if you're right in the middle of a lucrative career and God says move, you've got to go. Come on, amen. amen. And then he gives us a purpose. When you get saved, you get baptized, he becomes the Lord of your life. He directs your life. Come on, am I telling the truth or not? And then he leaves us here to glorify him. And the greatest way I know to glorify him is to share the gospel with as many people as we can. Come on, amen? As many people as we can. Let's pray. I don't want us to get ready to leave. I want us to get ready to do business with the Lord. And I wonder how many of you tonight can honestly, and listen, I can't see your heart. All I can do is take your word for it. You can fool me, but you can't fool God, right? And I wonder how many of you in this room tonight, don't just throw your hand up in the air because you have done that for all these years every time a preacher asks something like this. But I want to ask you this question. I've asked every service. If the Lord came back tonight, and boy, I believe we're close, don't you? Amen, I do. Man, just what's going on with Israel and all that's going on around the world. If the Lord came back tonight, if, if for some reason your heart beat for the last time tonight while you were asleep, how many of you can honestly say before God who knows everything, Bill, if I died tonight, if the Lord came back tonight, I know I'd be with the Lord Jesus in a place called heaven for all eternity. Not because I walked down an aisle, not because I prayed a prayer, not because I got baptized. I, I'm saved tonight by the grace of God, and he changed me, and I know that tonight. I am his, and he's mine. Can I see your hand up real high all over this room? Keep your hand up a minute. Thank the Lord. Say, thank you, Jesus. Save me. God bless you. But I want to ask you this question. How many of you here tonight would say, Bill, I, I'm just not sure if I'm saved. I just don't know. Listen. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 13, these things have been written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. I'm glad tonight because of the grace of God that I can go to bed, I can put my head on the pillow, 
and go sound asleep knowing that my soul is secure. Come on, amen. And some of you don't know that tonight. You lay in the bed, you look up in the darkness, and you wonder, boy, if the Lord came back, would I really go to be with him? You have all these doubts and question marks. Listen, you got to get it nailed down at some point. Come on, amen. You got to get it settled. So I'm going to ask teenagers, boys, girls, adults, guests, members, whoever you are tonight, men, women, you say, Bill, if I die tonight, if Jesus Christ came back tonight, I'm just not absolutely sure I'd be in heaven with the Lord. I want you to pray for me. Would you just raise your hand up real high all over this room tonight? God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? God bless you. Anybody else? Just slip your hand up real high. Put it right back down. God bless you. Anyone else? We're going to wait for just a minute. I know it's a big decision. Anybody else? I know God's speaking to other people. Just slip your hand up. Put it right back down. Say, pray for me. All right, now listen, I got some good news for you. The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says in that chapter, same chapter, chapter 10, that if we believe that Jesus Christ died for us, rose again from the dead, and we confess that with our mouth, we can be saved. Because with our heart we believe under righteousness, with our mouth we make confession under salvation. And the only way I know to call on the Lord is to pray. Now listen, it's not a prayer, it's just, it's not a magical prayer that saves you. It's the one we're praying to that saves you. But we're just going to do what the Bible says. We're going to confess that we've sinned against the holy God. We cannot save ourselves. That he died on the cross for our sin. He shed his blood. He rose from the dead. And he's alive. And we're willing to repent and turn to him from our sin and give him our life. You ready? I want everybody that raised their hand, even if you didn't, just pray with me right now. You can pray this prayer out loud. You can pray this prayer in your, uh, in your heart. You can, you can pray your own prayer. You just pray something like this. Are you ready? You say, Dear Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I have broken your law, God, and I cannot save myself. Tell him. And then say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin. I repent. Please cleanse me tonight. Forgive me. And right now, Jesus, I give you myself totally, completely. I give you myself totally, completely. And I receive you as my Lord and my Master and my God. And then tell him this, I'll live for you the rest of my life because you died for me. Now, with our heads bowed, eyes closed, somebody look around. How many of you just simply called on Jesus tonight asked him to pray, uh, to, to save you from your sin? Would you just slip your hand up real high where I can see you? You say, Bill, I'll pray with you tonight. God bless you. God bless you. Anyone else? Slip your hand up real high. Put it right back down. All right, now I'm going to ask you to do something. It's going to take some courage, okay? Now listen, it's going to take courage. I believe the Lord's going to help you. If you just prayed with me tonight, I want you to lift your head up and look at me. Just lift your head up and make eye contact. Guys, did y'all pray with me tonight? Huh? You mean business with the Lord? This isn't a game, is it? This is for real, right? Just keep looking right here if you prayed with me tonight. Did you ask the Lord to save you tonight? Amen. Anybody else? Just kind of wave at me. I want to see who you are. Did you ask the Lord to save you tonight? Wave at me. Somebody else? Somebody else, I want to talk to you for just a minute. The Bible says in Matthew 10, 32 and 33, just keep looking at me. He said, if you confess me before people here on earth, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me before men on earth, I'll deny you before the Father in heaven. What does that mean? Jesus has no secret disciples. Everybody that followed Jesus did it openly and publicly. One of the ways we know we mean it is we're not ashamed of it. That's one way I knew I got saved as a high school student. I wasn't ashamed of what Jesus did in my life. And before my whole student body, where I went to school, I confessed Jesus openly. So I'm going to ask you to do what Jesus commands us to do, and that's to publicly and openly confess it. So tonight, if you prayed with me, you've asked the Lord to save you, I want you to just stand up right where you are. Stand up right where you are. Don't wait on anybody else. Don't look around to see if anybody else is standing up. I want you to come meet the pastor right here. Just come on. 